Just when you think that the story can't get any worse, imagine yourself as not only a child, a mother, but a grandmother who has been alienated through the system, through the years, and con constantly trying to make sure that there is communication with the children but can't. Tonight I have with me Suzanne Spencer Abel. <laughs> Good evening. <laughs> Yeah. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Susan, can you tell us exactly when this all took place? When the alienation started with you during you know child? We'll start from the very oh, beginning. Oh wow. Okay. Um, um, uh, my mom um, began alienating us kids from the time that I can remember, and when they got divorced in the 1970s, um, my dad just disappeared. And my mom explained that, you know, he just didn't love us and didn't care, didn't feel like sending a card, didn't feel like sending a letter, or certainly no money. And um, that, that was her explanation. He just walked off the face of the earth. So completely disappeared out of your life. Mm -hmm. Now many years later, mm -hmm. you have become a mother. Mm -hmm. You've had children. You actually have three children that are now alienated from you while you have one child still at home. Yeah. Can you explain to us during that, actually sorry, 1990, correct? Yes. Okay, during this time, your ex-husband had filed for you know divorce and you said that this imploded after the divorce. Can you go from there and explain to me what happened? Um, well, he wanted the divorce and if one person doesn't want to be in a marriage, then the other person really doesn't have many choices. So, um, my theory, was if you make nice and you behave like adults, then there's no reason that life can't continue and share your children. Right. Share so your you're life. saying, okay, if we can play well together, mm -hmm. then we can co-parent, mm -hmm. we can get along, and our children mm -hmm. will be just fine, mm -hmm. which this didn't happen. Yeah, that was not on his agenda or his second wife's. And so they spent the next... Uh, well, they've now gotten divorced, so and it had been almost 20 years for their marriage. So they they spent the entirety of their marriage um, um, trying to get rid of me, and um, were unfortunately very successful. So um, they have different goals than I did. <laughs> different perception of the way to one. Yes. 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 Happened. Yes. Now, um, after he remarried, mm -hmm. you said that the stepmom had to so-called play a part in this. Can you explain exactly what she did for the alienation? You were saying that she was forging and... Well, yeah, yeah. She, she, had a, she has a few small issues as well. But um, their, their goal was to have a new nuclear family that did not involve any of the old trash, and that would have been me. And so they got rid of me by um, excluding me from all of their act, all my kids' activities, by refusing to give my name to their coaches. When I did get that information and called the coaches and said, can you tell me when the games are? No, we're not allowed to give you that information because you're stalking their child. And it's like, um, yeah, no, I'm pretty sure that the cesarean that, scar that I have is because I'm the one who gave birth to him. And yeah, well, you know, their attorney called and said that if you didn't, they're going to sue us. And it was highly effective. It kept me out of the schools. Um, my name um, suddenly morphed into the second wife's name, and she was listed as the mother on all of the documents. And um, she signed my name. I, they, I guess, couldn't figure out how to change the birth certificate, but not a problem. She just signed my name on their passports so that they could go. Um, it, it just wasn't a deterrent to them that, like following court orders. It's kind of like optional, right. and that's how they perceived life, and that's how they lived. Right. So now, most children, when they are alienated, they have repercussions. If mm -hmm. you talk to such and such, mm -hmm. you're going to get this taken away, that taken away. Can you explain what the repercussions was for your children that are alienated from you? That the new mom decided. Yeah. Well, they were very swift and very severe consequences. 
Um, this was back in the 1990s before cell phones, and so when the phone bill came in, if my phone number was on it anywhere, then the boys lost their telephone privileges, or their cable TV privileges, or their ability to um, go to an event that they wanted to go to, or they'd have their sports gear confiscated for a week, or whatever the punishment was. But it was pretty severe, and it usually, especially for my younger son, included physical violence. So, you know, if you're going to do that, whack it. <laughs> it's like, whoa, okay, then I'm not going to push. I'm, I voluntarily pulled back because I could see the physical, including the bruises. I knew what was going on, and I knew. Now, but you know, the thing is, you are trying to be actively involved. Yes. And the thing is that this stepmother mm -hmm. and ex-husband, father mm -hmm. of these children, mm -hmm. decided to up and railroad you. You can no longer have any communication because now your child is going to, one, be physically harmed, mm -hmm. and two, going to be scared to death because if they do have any contact with mom, I can't do this, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. So they start putting themselves in a shell. Yeah. They start closing off to any of the outside world, and then an automatic hatred yeah. comes in. Yeah. So can you explain to me, um, you did a little bit of a story about your younger son. Um, he refused to go to um, you know, the military school, correct? Or well, was sent to the military? He refused to stop talking to me. Okay. And he refused to lie to me about when things were happening. So if I knew he had hockey practice or a hockey game, and I'd say, hey, you know, when is your game? You know, he would tell me. And it turns out that was not a good thing to do. So dad and the stepmom decided the easiest way to solve that problem was to get rid of him. They couldn't get rid of me, then they'd get rid of him. So they uh, petitioned the court, and um, yeah, I was sat in a room and told, we'll, we'll all sit here until Christmas if that's what it takes, but you will agree that he is going. Yeah, and they, bu they bucked you back into a corner and said, you will do as I say, literally. or else. Yeah. yeah, and the conciliator did yeah. it as well. It was his attorney, my attorney, and the conciliator, and then in Pennsylvania, the spouse is not supposed to go into a conciliation hearing but that fortunately isn't a problem when the spouse is an attorney and knows how to pull strings so everybody else in pennsylvania it's the mother and the father and in my cases it was the mother the father and the stepwife so it was dad the stepwife their attorney who was really a piece of artwork the conciliator and my attorney all literally backing me into a corner they were and conspiring saying, saying well or uh, it, it almost seemed like it though or you know the way everything was going against you though the decision had already been made the the decision i had to make was do i want to agree to their decision now or do i want to wait and agree in three minutes but not agreeing was not an option okay. right. so they got what they wanted and they shipped him out to valley forge and um, he was there for a year and they, dad and stepmom had promised that he would not have to go back if he had really good grades. Well, that kid busted his hump, and he got awesome grades, no behavioral issues, anything. And he thought, I did what I'm supposed to do. I will get what I was told would be the reward, which is, now you don't have to go back next year. Yeah, now they had already planned to send him back and it sent him over the edge. So his first suicide attempt was about three months after that. Yeah, see this is the whole process of parental alienation. The court system doesn't realize what kind of detrimental harm it does to these children. I mean, unsubstantial amount of damage that cannot ever be redone. And as we see, a son has attempted suicide because of not having a connection with his mother. And you were saying that he had he was no longer allowed to have any communication at all with you, correct? Oh, I, no, that ended way back when they were still teens. Okay. Yeah. And um, I would show up for visitation, and the stepmother would come. Oh, did I forget to tell you? And the kids are gone. Um, right. And and to her, it was funny. It was a game, you know, to watch her dancing out of the house. It, it was like. Do you not get that this is my time with my children? But she knew it. That she knew exactly right. what she was doing. She was just so pleased with herself. She couldn't help. Right. Yeah. yeah. She's manipulating the system yeah. so that you could not get to see your own flesh and right. blood. Right. Now, kind of fast forward, you have five grandbabies. Yeah. Can you explain to yeah. us what is going on with that situation with the grandchildren now? Because yeah. you are also an alienated grandmother. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, someday, God willing, I will get to meet them, um, even if it's just briefly. Um, I have a little thing up my sleeve that I know because I've got a 15-year-old at home and my 30-year-old kids don't know because they came of age before cell phones and internets. And my 15-year-old is in the middle of that. And I see the difference that having that technology makes in her life and the way that communications have changed. And specifically with things like, um, I believe it's Snapchat, where the, pic, the message comes up for 30 right. seconds or 10 seconds and it's gone. And I'm thinking, yeah, if my boys had known about that 25 years ago, yeah. we would have been able to communicate. Mm -hmm. And so I know that while they're not allowed to communicate with me right now, I don't even know if some of them know I exist. I know my daughter told my grandson that I have died, which is... Yeah, you said that the, your daughter had went over to speak to her sibling, mm -hmm. and she is alienated from her sibling now. Yeah. And that's when you said that the, um, was it the brother that was in the home? No, it was her boyfriend. Her boyfriend, yes, that... You did not exist, that she did not exist, yeah. nobody. You know, she, my, my girlfriend doesn't have a sister and her mother is dead. And I'm, I'm looking at my daughter and I'm looking at her and I'm I don't know, this looks pretty real to me, but. Right. Well, is there anything you that you would like to say to your children as a message that we know you're a loving mom and a loving grandmother? <laughs> and many of us have seen not just the mother that, you know, um, is always the one punished, but it goes farther than that. It goes to the grandparents. Yeah. Is there anything you would like to say, you know, to your grandchildren and your, your children itself, a message that, you know, you do still care, that you do love? Them? Yeah. Um, to my kids, I want them to know that I love them and that um, my heart breaks that I was not able to protect them. From this and it is just as broken that my grandchildren have been swept into this current of unhealth. Um, I do believe really strongly that there will come a time when my grandchildren will get in touch with me. Um, I believe that like with myself and my dad that there will come a time when they say, oh my gosh, is it possible I was lied to? I hope for their sake that it's before I die because my dad passed 25 years ago. And when I finally put the pieces together last year, yeah, that's painful. That's really, really hard. So don't give up and don't ever question that I love you. And you're always, always welcome in my family, and in my heart, and in my home. Thank you. Well, Susan, I want to say I greatly appreciate everything, you know, <laughs> and, and you're a strong woman. You really are. And for to go, as, you know, through life on, on this trail, this journey, mm -hmm. you have done a wonderful job, you know, holding yourself up. And um, we're very, very proud of you. And we want you to keep speaking out. And... Um, and, and continue to, to be strong for the rest of the grandmothers out there. Because <laughs> a lot of them don't believe that this is, you know, um, happening to just grandparents. And, you know, to us, you're, you're the prodigy, too. If you're out here speaking, you, you know, you're, you're strong. You're a fighter, so keep doing it, you know. The keep... good thing about being at this end of it is I have nothing left to lose. I was blackmailed and threatened for 15 years every time I picked up the phone. Every time I showed up at school, there was always the threats and the intimidation and the fear. And I'm done. I don't have to. Um, I don't have to hide anymore, and I'm not going to. Thank you. Well, thank you, Suzanne, for for coming this evening. We have another guest with us this evening. Uh, her name is Nia T. Nia T. Hi. 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 All right. Can you explain to us um, a little bit of what you've got going on here? There, there's quite a bit, because um, we have been talking about parental alienation, sibling alienation, and alienation of the court in general. Can you explain your circumstances? This is my new diamond necklace. <laughs> I love it. I lost everything. I have nothing. I have two adult boys now. When we went to the divorce, actually my husband had started application for the complaint without my signature. 
still I got the divorce. I was working on the reconciliation and that was my time, 27th year of the marriage, I found out that my kids were alienated from me for 14 years. I did not know, and he had been traveling. My kids had been always in the higher ranking of the school studies, academic program, but I was the bad mother, which I didn't know. I didn't know that I had been a crazy person. I found out all those titles during the proceedings when the judge started telling me all this. And it was a very shocking news. I have been homeless. I lost everything. I have almost a million dollar home, which is just given to the husband because I couldn't prove that he was doing the sex with his girlfriend. Who's going to call? Huh? And the judge told me that if you had that picture, I would believe you. I had so many um, stories to show that he has a non-marital relationship somewhere. Or the bank account for and chips. Here we can see from the beginning his income is going up and up. That's a family assets. This is me going down and this is my family assets which went up and then we are down. But he's still rising. And all assets were transferred. My kids have been working since age of 14 when they were allowed to work. All their bank accounts were emptied. The college funds we were saving were emptied by him. He had forged my signature on the tax returns on the lien of the home when he had already seen the profit from the first house. He still got approved for the lien. He forged my signature. And that debt still comes on me. I couldn't do the bankruptcy. I mean, I have nothing. I slept myself on the streets. Means I couldn't lie down, but I was awake whole night at ER, at airport, at the 24 hours wise grocery center, McDonald's. Every third day I was moving because I did not want to be raped. And in Howard County, it was high hike wrecking that people were getting raped in the night, especially the homeless. I have gone through a lot. I came here to study MBA and I came with only $22 in my pocket. One time I was a wealthy woman, wealthy mother, wealthy wife. But if I knew these bank accounts were not belonging to me, he had 14 bank accounts and I had only two bank accounts with my children but which were all emptied by him. I have been disabled. Whatever the money I was awarded was transferred to his account by he forged my signature on the checks. I took all the evidences in the court because I found out everything during the separation period. I did not know he stole his company's money in the 98 when he was asked to resign from the work. I have the email between him and his supervisor where he is requesting to bring him back. I took all those evidences, but the judge did not want to see anything. Three times I was being kind of yelled by the judge that I don't want to see your evidences, put them back. Because my lawyers were bought out. The DVC, which is called Domestic Violence Center, the first time when we went, and it's recorded, it's on my testimony, and it's on my trial period, where the first DVC, the judge was ready to give me, putting him outside my home for a one year, like a restraining order, and his attorney took the judge in the chamber, and the decision was changed. And this is on the audio recording, on the testimony, and the DVC attorney did not help me. I had no clue what was happening. The second DVC happened where I got bruises. I was shown behind the doors. My hair were pulled off. My things were all emptied on the floor because he was drunk. And when the police came, police told me, yeah, I see the bruises, I see the scratches. So when I went to the DVC center next day, because police asked me to be there for my safety, the DVC attorney did not show up. I did not know what was happening. And the judge told me that I lied and I hurt myself. Why would I hurt myself? 
I mean, you know, I cannot believe all this. But during all this time, my kids were already adults. And they were already alienated. So I had no clue. I called them. I emailed them that I want to go for dinner. Which email I took it to the court. Just to show that I'm trying to reach out my children. And during reconciliation, my husband told me, not me. I haven't talked to him since April 2012. Uh, there is no contact with him at all. And he told my friends that she can go anywhere. She's not going to win because I'm going to make sure that she gets punished. Punished in what way? Because I was a naive, I was a trustworthy person. He traveled for 22 years in my marriage out of 27 years where he maintained his non-marital relationships. This girl he's married to, she moved to USA, I think, and in 2007, she had something DVC from her marriage, and she went through the divorce. My mother-in-law introduced that girl to my husband because she was her student back home in India. And the way the story came, November 2014, that my husband met them, two of them, online dating, and in two weeks, huh? Look at this. If I had a DVC, I would marry to another man in two weeks, huh? I mean, but she didn't have a status to stay in USA, so he got married to her, and now she's everything, getting all my assets, what I earned and I deserve it. And my kids, I'm trying to reconnect with them. I have lost those 12 years in my life because whatever he ill mouth about me with my friends and everything, they don't believe me. I was trying myself to prove after everything I lost, but then I realized that these people will not understand anything until they go through this. I don't want anybody to do this. I have lost everything. I have no assets today, no even a $20 bill. But I'm still in this boat because I want to bring all the kids who are either being alienated or who are being raped or who are right now in the foster house or in adoption house. I want them to stay with their parents. Being a parent, I know it's very sad to be by themselves, you know. So I'm in this boat with you and with all other mothers and the fathers who are being alienated because it's an abuse and this abuse has to stop. Absolutely, I agree. Well, I appreciate your story. Um, I mean, we're, we're sorry that anyone has to go through this. Um, to you know, have your children, a perfect life, and then all of a sudden, literally, the rug gets ripped out up from underneath your feet and you are struggling from day to day. But you know what, you don't give up. And that's what you know, I admire about you. You keep going on, you keep making sure that you know, no one's left in the dark about what has went on. And you want to educate people about circumstances that could lead to a possible narcissist who takes everything away from you. But you know, there's one thing you have, and that's hope, and hope that one day you can reconnect with your children, and that they'll never take away from you. Right, one more thing I want to share. I finally almost completed my complaint against the judges in my Howard County and the state of Maryland. This complaint um, is almost done, 90 percentile of the story is completed. I just have to do some edit and uh, proofreading. But Tuesday, 99 percent, I will be made to FBI, Department of Justice in US, Attorney General of Maryland, and the Judiciary Disabilities of Maryland. Four units will definitely get. Governor has already received this, Governor Hogan. And I called him three times and he has not received. So I will visit to Annapolis by myself and going to do hand delivery to him and the Lieutenant Governor. Uh, so that you know they have it and they don't say that they don't have it. That's right. Yes. You're right to the source. Correct. You make sure that they do get that. Yes. Because that thing of, oh, well, we didn't get it. To me, it's not substantial no. enough. I want to make sure that you know this is what you get now. Tell me another lie because you have it in your hand. Sure. I love your tactic. Thank you. I also <laughs> want to thank you as well yeah. as becoming a chapter leader for Punish for Protecting. Yes, thank you. Thanks yeah. to Francisca and everybody, you know, for honoring me that.
in the state and, and here in, in, in for in the state of Maryland. So yes, correct. Yes, thank you. And I'm also at CLU Maryland lead or chapter whatever they want to title it. But I've been there since I lost everything. I'm just here to bring kids home because truth prevails. That's what I know in my life. Absolutely. Thank you for and having me. Yes, and like I said, I want to thank you for you know joining us and being a Maryland chapter leader and and all of the work that you do to make sure that people um, realize this is an issue. It's nothing that is going to go away overnight, but it affects every single person. Well, thank you, James and Thank you. Nice seeing you. Nice. Thank, thank you. you. I also would like to introduce a chapter leader here in Pennsylvania. Her name is Tamara Sweeney, and she also uh, has Love Dominate. So please welcome Tamara Sweeney. Thank you very much, Missy. I appreciate it. Um, Can you tell us a little about exactly what Love Dominates is? Sure. Love Dominates is a nonprofit 501c3, and we are trying to educate and make awareness to what's called parental alienation and to stop the court corruption. That's good. You know, people aware that this is not just an isolated issue. It is everywhere. And you have went above and beyond that, that call, correct? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I feel like it. It's been, really, it's been about six years since the court system, um, but it's ongoing. It's... I, what drives me crazy about people, they'll sit there and say, forget about your kids, move on with your life, and eventually they'll come back. That's, I don't believe in that. And what I'm trying to do is get my message out there. Uh, my kids have been told that I don't love them. My kids have been told that I hated them. They've been told false allegations. And this isn't just for me, this is for everybody. Everyone's in the same boat. So how I came up with Love Dominates was, um, my overall message is to be love, because love will prevail. Um, love is the ultimate power in life. So I figured if I had that power behind me and that message behind me, that maybe, maybe I'll be able to get to my kids a lot sooner. Right. Now, the thing is, in D.C., you were telling us that a child normally knows exactly what love is, but they learn hate, correct? Absolutely. So... What I was trying to explain is love comes natural to a child. So you have an infant, you know, you're teaching them, you're cuddling them, you're, you're giving them all that love. They feel that love. They understand it. It's natural. Hatred is a learned behavior. No child naturally hates anyone. Um, that has to be taught to them. Absolutely. And the big thing I also want to um, try to get people to understand is especially in people in this situation, is uh, compassion over judgment. So the next time someone's telling you something um, or explaining one of these horrific stories, have compassion for that person. Stop judging people. But the only person who judges is God. Right. You know, he has the last call <laughs> on judgment day. Exactly. And the thing that gets me is there's people that are out there pointing the finger saying, well, you lost your kids. You must have did something wrong. Exactly. When in fact, it is the total opposite. Exactly. What they need to look at is who the children are with is the one who is the issue. Um, if that child is not seeing that other parent, that other parent was that loving, kind parent. The one that they're with is that alienator and has brainwashed those children. Because each child deserves to love both parents equally. This isn't a bias thing. And every child deserves to have both parents in their lives. Right. Instead of ripping them out. Two parents to conceive, two parents to love, and two parents to raise. Not just one or another. Wait. I used to say all the time, I'll probably get in trouble for this, but I'm, I'm like, your sperm, my egg. You know, right? it's 50 50 here. That's it. So, and, and it's awful. Yeah, because... but which came first? No, I'm kidding. Exactly. <laughs> no, but what's really bad is um, sort of like the example of if you were to cut the roots of a tree, um, you know, half of those roots or whatever, you're, you're losing that on the child. So, my children have lost me. They have totally lost me and my side of my family. So, just think of the damage that it would do to a tree, the damage it would do to a child. I mean, it's right. as simple as that. Um, 
Today uh, is, well, actually November 6th, my, my oldest son's birthday. I've been alienated from him for uh, six years now. And my parents go by Oma Oda. Um, and we made this shirt for my his grandfather when he was a child because my dad's a wrestling coach. So it was kind of cute. So I'm going to give this back to him. But I also want to dedicate something to my mother. My mom died over this. She did not see her grandkids for five years. And at the funeral, two of my children didn't show up at the funeral. Um, but my, my husband, you know, at the time, would fly them around the world to go to a, a party, a drinking party or whatever. But he won't fly my children in to, you know, go to my mom's funeral. Right. It's so every horrific. child needs to have family first. Yep. And that's the thing. Don't worry about all the unnecessary things in a child's life. You know, worry about the family, and that's where it should be. Yep. Um, also so what I did for my son, my son is going to be 23 years old. So I'm actually, this is what a targeted parent goes through for our birthdays. Since I've never been able to sell, celebrate a birthday for my child, I want to make sure he remembers the things that I taught him. So I wrote up a poster that says, my mother taught me how to cuddle, how to have happiness, adventure, heritage, culture, playtime, arts and crafts time. I mean, it goes on and on. Um, but most of all, how to never give up, never lie, cheat, steal, to be honest, truthful, caring, respectful, to go with your gut feelings, find your passions in life and go for it, and always have compassion and love. That's what I was trying to um, teach my children. And this is my oldest. Um, he was alienated the most because uh, my husband at the time made him responsible for the other children. So now he had to take care of the other children and try help, you know, helping in the hate campaign. And then my other poster <laughs> here has, um, and actually one of the pictures fell out, but what I wanted to teach him here is I did a happy timeline. So my child was completely innocent, completely happy from, you know, I nursed him all the way up to 17. You know, we didn't have an issue. Um, Probably around 14, 15, he started to get in a little mouthy because his father always undermined me and gave him that. You know, I, I could give millions of examples, but I mean, I had lifeguard jobs for my son, this one in particular, and he would go up to my son, you don't need a job, you can sit on the beach for 10 bucks an hour, I'll pay you 10 bucks an hour. So like, just crazy stuff that was always, you know, dad says yes, I say no, or vice versa. Yeah, yeah mom's... Yeah, advice was never good enough for him. Yeah, so what he did was he put the children ahead of me. So the children were, you know, meanwhile, I'm the only caretaker, but he put the children above me and, um, you know, always undermined me. They could walk all over me. They could walk all over their teachers, coaches, whatever they wanted. So it was awful. So these are, um, this is Dylan when he was three years old. I mean, he was happy kid very innocent um you know he's the first child always kind of reserved but he was very hard on himself an athlete so i tried to build confidence and structure in them by giving them activities um and now when i think about it back about it um i had him in karate because i didn't have a, a father figure that would unite with me as parents so i used these coaches to help be a parent to my child isn't that awful? Mm -hmm. Like, I never thought of it that way. But now that I'm out of the, the box, mm -hmm. the control box, that's really what I was doing. I coached all their teams. Um, and then at the bottom here, this my parents were also alienated from them. This is my mother, um, Coletta Jean Gerstemeyer. Mm -hmm. She was a school teacher. She loves children. Loves children, both my parents. Coaches, teachers. And she loves all kids. And then she couldn't see her own grandkids? I mean, it just doesn't make sense. But the reason my kids cut them off is because my mom came around and started supporting me, and then they were cut off. So my mom basically died over the stress of not seeing her grandkids. Her health just went down. And that does happen to a lot of grandparents and parents because this is a mental cruelty that you know is injected into our lives, unfortunately. 
And because of that, you know, there is people that has had strokes and heart attacks and, you know, now yep. to death. And she actually had, um, it was yeah. amyloid disease. But what I found, and I haven't really said this publicly, but um, my brother manipulated my mom. And my brother, uh, when I went to clean up my mom's room, let's say, she, he had, my mom had her psych evalu my psych evaluation by her bed. So she was reading it right before she went to sleep, and then she never woke up. So it's just the constant pressure of who's right, who's wrong, the manipulation, the, the false allegations. Yeah, the tug of war of the, the system and how it, you know, is manipulative and putting one parent against the other. And like you said, it's a 50-50. We both have yeah. to be in a child's life. You can't say, oh, one parent's better than the other. That's not how it works. That's it wasn't right. how it worked when they, you know, they were brought into this world and it should not work to this day. Exactly. There's not, in the real world, it's not 100%, like one parent's 100% right and the other parent's 100% wrong. There's, mm -hmm. you know, his side, her side, and the story lies somewhere in the middle. Yeah. Right. And then unfortunately, it's, the child it, has to pick through that, you know, in order to come back from the alienation. The, the side that, you know, the parent that they were alienated from was, in fact, the one that was trying to protect them to begin with. Yes. That's a hard thing to come around. Yeah. For them, anyway. I, I do not hold my children responsible at all. I will never, ever hold them accountable for their actions of how they treated me or anything. Right. Um, because they were manipulated, and so was I. Right. Well, Tamara, I want to appreciate you coming on. Thank you very evening. much. And um, thanks everyone again for joining us this evening. And uh, we want to say happy 23rd birthday. Dylan, yep. Tamara, would you like to go ahead? <laughs> <laughs> happy birthday, Dylan. I love you. I love all my kids. Dylan, Dalton, Anya, and Dustin. Thank you. Thanks everyone um, for joining us this evening. Please go to punishedforbeingaparent.com and join our advocacy page at Punish for Protecting National Advocacy. Thanks everyone and God bless.